Welcome to SciArc. Um, we always say, it is my pleasure to introduce so, so, and so. And this is one of the first times I really mean it. And it, it's, it's my true pleasure to introduce Christian Miller. Um, yeah, he, aside that he's a terrific artist, he happened to be a really good friend of mine. Um, I'm going to be brief because I really want you guys to enjoy uh, Christian's presentation. Um, there is a couple of things that is incredibly remarkable about Christian and, and Christian's work. One is he has a very unusual condition for a German guy, which is he has a sense of humor, uh, a very cynical and perverse one, which I truly enjoyed. Every time that he tells you about the project that he's working, he never can finish what he's saying because he bro break into laughing in the middle, like the way that he feels like he's scamming the people that are investing in the project, which I always find incredibly interesting. Now, Christian is uh, or was, by let's say academic degree, an architect. But at some moment he decided that architecture either was boring or uninteresting or too pretentious or too limiting. And he started to explore different territories. Um, the truth is, there's not one way to define the scope of his work. I mean, it can be uh, fall under what is called today media art, or hybrid art, or whatever you want to call it. I always find it incredibly difficult to define it. Um, but certainly, his work has a level of rigor and sophistication, and is very unusual. And ultimately, the most important thing to me is his work is incredibly original. And I know that originality is not a word that we tend to appreciate any more or not with the passion that we should keep appreciating. His work always has a territory that has not, never been explored before. And I cannot think of many architects or designers that we can say the same. So I'm really eager to see what Christian is up to these days. Um, also, um, the last thing I want to mention, as an educator, him, among others, were sort of the inventors of the media art as an academic f form. Um, he's one of the professors in UCLA, the media art department, which is something that they didn't exist, let's say, 20 years ago. Um, what I'm trying to say is he had the weird characteristic to be a pioneer in a field that sort of he helped invent it, but he's still shaping it and keep rethinking and reinvent it every time on every year, every project that he does. So please join me to welcome Christian Miller to SciArc. Thank you, Anand, for this very friendly introduction. I know Anand probably almost since the day I came here in late 2001. I don't know how that happened. When we met first time, I really have forgotten. But what I remember is that we, pretty much up to today, we, we never spent time talking about our work. There were many other things we were talking about we found probably more exciting. Uh, so I'm surprised that you know all the things about me, kind of. Strange. I, I thought we we were sharing only the appreciation for Cuba. For <laughs> yeah, I thought it was the Cuban cigars, which my wife ordered me to stop smoking anyway. Uh, I come I come from architecture. That is true, and I changed into the arts at the end of the 80s. Um, the reasons for 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 this change is not because it's boring. Uh, I didn't find it boring, but I was working in a very famous architecture studio in Germany called Benisch and Partner. At that time, actually, probably the number one studio, at least for me, in Germany. Uh, and uh, it's a studio with about maybe 100 people working there, all younger people, or were my age, kind of in the mid and 20s. And um, and when you, the good thing is if you, when you working in such a professional environment with so many people at the same age like you, it's not very difficult to compare yourself and your skills with the others. And I was, let's say, on 
if I would have ranked it from zero to 10, 10 would be really good. I was kind of a guy between six and seven and, um, and uh, compared to my colleagues. And um, that uh, made me consider to switch profession. The other reason, <laughs> thank you very much. It's too late, now it's embarrassing. <laughs> good timing. Uh, the other, the, other, the other reason was that um, there's something what I found always a little narrow in the architecture world is that architects are hanging out with other architects a lot. And uh, um, they meet their girlfriend or boyfriend in the architectural world, they marry, and then they get children, and they become architects. And they, I, there was, there was <clears throat> That was not exactly what I wanted. I wanted to work in an environment where it's more open, uh, where it's uh, more influenced by, by different kind of angles. I found Warhol's factory always a kind of a remarkable idea of how I could maybe potentially organize my life, and that's why I <coughs> went into a different direction. And this here was my first piece of work I did. Uh, it was the... I was trying to sample the sound of the growing grass, and that was not very successful, I have to say. <laughs> right pretty much after this, I got not even two years out of architecture, trying to make a, a living as an independent young artist. I got this gigantic commission for a building uh, in Frankfurt, for a facade of a building in Frankfurt, it was at the same time when Toyo Ito did the Towers of Wind, of wind uh, in Osaka. Uh, and uh, what I came up with was a, was a facade that changes it, its light, its color distribution of the lighting system according to the outside weather conditions. Today, not very exciting. Uh, in 1990, that was a kind of a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, just rem remember it was about four years before we started to recognize an, inter an internet as, as an existing phenomenon. Can you bring up the volume a little bit? <coughs> um, then, I, then I had uh, quite success in the the theater world. Um, this became a very well-recognized piece um, called Ik uh, Electroclips. It's a it's a dance floor uh, with light sensors, and while the dancer Stephen K Stephen Galloway from the Foresight Ensemble, probably one of the one of the best dancers at that time in the world, when he cuts the lights moving around, he interrupts the light falling on these sensors, and that generates the music. So he's he's not dancing to the music; he's playing an instrument with his dance. Was, uh, the, the sound samples were made by Pete Namluk, you heard, was kind of very techno driven, a very 1990 uh, sort of music environment. Uh, a few years later, I, I show you here a, a number of works. I, I made a million of these interactive works. I show you here a selection of the better ones. And um, this, is, this is one I did in Spiral Art Center in Tokyo. Beautiful building by the architect Fumi Komaki. And uh, they hired me to build a sculpture in this main space. Oh, actually, no, it was a solo show, but, they, but I, it was important for them that I make a big sculpture in this main space. And, uh, and I like this spiral kind of room, and, uh, and I wanted to do something with a, with a degree of transparency. Didn't want to visually hide this or, or fill up the space. And uh, came up with this structure of vertical steel poles, and they are all touch sensitive. 
the moment you touch them, they generate music. If you touch two of them, you, trans you are transponding the, uh, the overall audio experience one octave up or down. This is a one to uh, ten scale model of that installation. What is completely 100% functional because my composer here, Ludger Brummer, amazing character, refused to work with me until I give him something what is a physical simulation of the environment because he refused to do it with a keyboard. Um, that was a painful thing, uh, but maybe he was right, maybe it paid back. It is not easy to make this kind of non-linear music and uh, here he was able to do a very, very successful piece of music. I mean, you never know when which note is played, right? So, so <clears throat> it's different than just composing something together. People are wandering around in this space, uh, playing this instrument, and uh, at night you will see it is surrounded by a by a huge number of profile spotlights or light projectors, and they are all projecting the exact same square into uh, onto the floor of the of the installation and we are switching the light positions with touching with the same system that when, when you touch the poles and this way you are generating these light and shadow textures onto the floor of the building. We, I mean when I do such a thing with, I mean if you do in these kind of interactive works there's always a moment of surprise involved in it. And very often this moment of surprise is not, <coughs> not uh, such a great experience. And, uh, and here it turned out, I mean, everything worked, worked perfectly. We prepared it, we, we, had plenty of, we had enough time to set it up, to try it out, and I knew that the day of the opening it will be, there will be hundreds of people coming, it will be full, and it, w and it will work with hundreds of people in this installation uh, playing it at the same time. But then when we opened the doors and it happened, it actually was horrible because what I didn't realize is that people, for some reason, they were all touching two poles at the same time. And that didn't work. That was, <laughs> they were not supposed to do that. And, um, <laughs> and uh, but if you do, if you work with these interactive systems, you find your tricks to work around problems like that. And uh, so I ran up the, to the office uh, of the gallery and, uh, and I've written a little, a few lines of text on a piece of, on a, on a piece of, on a computer on a, uh, to just explain how the installation works. A completely unnecessary, uh, obsolete <coughs> or redundant piece of information. I printed it out as often as we could and, uh, and then I handed it out to some helpers and they were handing it out to the people in the installation. And from that moment on they had a piece of paper in one hand and they could touch it only with the other. <laughs> when, uh, when things are working well then elements, then, then I sometimes I use them more often while I try to keep, let's say, the repetition in my work as low as possible because that is what excites me uh, in my doing. But uh, if something is very successful, then I use it a few times. And I use these uh, analog capacitive steel poles, uh, these touch sensitive steel poles uh, a few more times. And here in an installation I did in Schloss Eggenberg in Graz um, as part of an exhibition about the, the history of uh, language and writing. Um, the major, the main piece of the exhibition was this painting of Peter Bruegel, the, the Tower of Babel. And, uh, and I uh, built this installation in the courtyard of this palace and um, each of these steel poles is representing one of the languages, of all languages, we can receive via satellite dish on the northern hemisphere. And, uh, and uh, each pole has a, has a name engraved, you can see that there, 
uh, and this is the country of origin of this language. And the moment somebody touches one of these poles, the state radio channel of this country will broadcasting live into this courtyard. And if many people are doing it at the same time, then you get this confusion of tongues. There's Genesis 11 uh, uh, myth uh, of Babylon. To, to build such a an, such an technology-driven environment indoors is relatively easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's not so difficult compared to what it means to build it outdoor in Austria in the springtime where you can still expect half a meter of snow. Um, these touch, these analog capacitive things, they don't like that very much. And uh, so we had, uh, we had a lot of time and we spent a huge effort uh, to figure that out. I think we were working on this piece more than two years, probably close to three years. We had all the money in the world. It was sponsored by one of the greatest museums in the world. Uh, uh, and then at the day of the opening, can you believe it, the first bomb was falling onto Babylon. And that whole thing was about it. So the, the pole of Iraq became the main attraction of this uh, piece. People were standing around it and were listening to some kind of ridiculous swing jazz music from the 60s. And a day later, the thing became silent and never made a sound anymore again. You call that a coincidence. The, then uh, I did one or two more of these installations. And then sometimes I say bye-bye to, I mean kind of more officially bye-bye to elements of my work. I think Le Corbusier said it once, right? Uh, every once in a while you have to burn down, make a picture of your house and burn it down and build another one. Um, and keep the old one in good memory, right? And, uh, and so here, this is the last pole, touch sensitive pole I, I made, and I will, I will not make another one. Um, and there was a show in, in London, an art show dealing with energy, which was, uh, entirely sponsored with a lot of money by the company British Petroleum. And, uh, and uh, I called it Do Not Touch. And it's relatively self-explaining. I mean, it's about energy, right? So, so if you touch it, you get electrocuted. And if you touch it three times, you get three times elect electrocuted. <clears throat> what is weird that everybody touches it at least two times. I don't know why. <laughs> and actually, it really hurts. I mean, it's, 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 it's not fun at all. <clears throat> I, like, I like to show this project for a different reason, um, because it's, it's relatively silly. Um, but, but what it shows uh, is how far you can get if everyone wants it, and if you push hard enough. The, in the United Kingdom, they have also things like lawsuits and, uh, and uh, safety regulations, and, and uh, they are scared that somebody with a pacemaker will be harmed by an installation like this. And, and, uh, and this museum belongs to the Queen of England, and she has a lot of equity. And so all these, all these factors, they, <clears throat> they kind of made it seem to be impossible to make such a piece of work. But it turned out that the curator and the director of the museum liked it so much that they found themselves a new head of safety, because the other one didn't want to be there anymore. And, um, and, uh, and they spent more money on the paperwork for insurances, and I don't know what you needed for this, more money for the, all this kind of stuff around it than for the work itself. It was remarkable. And then uh, they, 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 they reconfigured it a little bit from our original design, technically, hiring a company, what is the equivalent of Harley Burden, just from England, 
and they have a lot of experience with uh, with these kind of things, I guess. And um, and uh, they uh, they were riding off on it, and they took the responsibility that nobody's going to be harmed. And <clears throat> so we were able to build that thing. Um, this is a project where I was a little less successful. Uh, you know it, it's the, the Reichstag in Berlin with the glass dome, or with the, I mean, renovated by Norman Foster and this glass dome on top of it. And I got a call somewhat in the really, really early morning, like seven o'clock in the morning, pick up the phone. I was working out of, a, out of my home at that time. And, uh, and the director of uh, the Museum of German History was on the phone and he, and he said, uh, Möller, are you interested in making an installation on top of the Reichstag in the Norman Foster Dome. <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, yes, I'm interested. Uh, and he said, yeah, but uh, you have to find a way how to deal with the uh, third national symbol. And then I was silent for a moment, not only because I was tired, it's also because I had no clue what he was talking about. And, and, I didn't, and then he was, uh, you, you don't know what, and so he started talking to me a little bit like a general talks down from his horse to his soldier, right, and explaining what that means. So, the, and you all know that for sure. The first national symbol are the colors of the country. In Germany, it's black, red, gold. The, the second national symbol is, I think we call it emblem. Uh, the, I mean, we have this bird, this eagle, in Germany, and Americans have also an eagle. Ours looks more like a fat hen, <laughs> right? Uh, and then the third, the third national symbol is the national anthem. So then I got it. They want me to, to find a way how to play the German national anthem <laughs> on the roof of the Reichstag in that dome, uh, while everybody knows this is impossible. <laughs> Maybe you can do that in other countries, but Germany is the one country where that would really not fly. I mean, even the, even let's say the most right-winger conservative backbencher in the House of Parliament would know you can't put loudspeakers up and play that music all the time. Um, so, well, why why me, right? So, so then I came up with this idea to 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 build a plate flash into the, the, the concrete floor at the entrance area of that dome, having it look like, like a little bit like a gutter, just out of better material like brass and then engraved into it, uh, das Lied der Deutschen, that's the name of it, by uh, Haydn and the text by Fallersleben. And having this thing sitting on feather springs, that's, a, that's a, 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 a very common thing you find wherever you have heavy machines sitting uh, on the concrete floor and you want to separate the vibration from these heavy machines from the construction, you put these, these rubber metal elements in, uh, in between. So the, the plate would sit on it and would be activated with a very, very strong vibrator, computer controllable vibrator. Uh, they call it an actuator, basically. The, this is the guy here on the right who invented this sort of thing for the German railroad. There's this beautiful competition between uh, the Shinkansen in Japan, the TGV in France, in, Fra in, in, Fra in Fra France, and the, and the ICE in Germany, all probably fantastic trains. Uh, but the German one had a little bit of a hiccup in the beginning uh, when, it, when, it, when it was put on the rails. And uh, that had a little to do, it's interesting, I, I like to, to communicate that story. Um, because it's a very German thing. Um, the, we all understand that the sleepers under the rails are distributed in regular intervals, right? They don't need to be too precisely exactly the same distance, but in Germany they are to a tenth of a millimeter exactly on the same distance. <laughs> and we also understand that a heavy train on the rail 
will kind of create a hill and valley sort of performance going over, over, over the rails. That's not surprising. What is surprising is that the, the regularity of this hill and valley on the German rail is reshaping the steel wheel of the train into a regular shape, what's kind of closer to a triangular shape. You know, finally it would be a triangle, I don't know, but, but it, it, it deforms it in a regular pattern so that at a certain speed, it, I've forgotten what it was, it was something like 100 miles per hour, um, the, this vibration played on the rail is catching the exact resonance frequency of the case of the train and that makes a sound at that particular speed which is not just noise, it's when actually the inlays of your teeth are falling out of your face. <laughs> and, they were, and they were not able to keep it that way. So they had, to, they had to do something with it. And one idea was to put a very heavy duty vibrator on it, measure the frequency in real time, and then vibrate that exact frequency, just shift it half an amplitude uh, back into the train and cancel it out. It was not taken. Uh, I read it and I was, I was unsuccessful and I contacted the inventor, Tilman Freudenberg, if he would be interested to play the German national anthem with his vibrator and he said, well, great idea, let's do this. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so, and so we, we, but that's the first prototype, we built that platform with three vibrators out of wood, what was a bad mistake because it then performed like a loudspeaker. But what is interesting, a student filmed this scene here in my studio and and it shows me stepping for the very first time on the thing, and I still like that. It's just a, a sinus signal to make it move, but it's very original. I'm gonna share that with you. So, what I say first is, boring and now I'm changing my mind you see <laughs> it makes really the tears coming out of you that's amazing. Um, then uh, it was cancelled. I, I, uh, I pre well, actually, that's a good story. There's an image missing. How do I make it stop? Well, I can't. Jesus, I don't want to see this guy. Um, um, so I, I, I found. I forgot what that whole idea was about. Sorry. The, so the the idea was that. This steel plate there on the floor, perforated as it was, is not moving any air. It doesn't make the sound like this, this wooden plate. So it's completely secret, it's completely silent. The moment you step on it, it vibrates uh, the German national anthem into your body. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when you, if you want to, you can close your ears and then your skull becomes the resonance body for this thing and you can hear the melody. And uh, I, 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 I ended my presentation by saying, well, this is, a, this is a version of the German national anthem, what moves you physically without creating any pathos. And I found that a very smart thing to say. Uh, they didn't. Uh, <laughs> they, they were verbally beating the hell out of me. And uh, if you ever have, if you ever has, have the chance to, to present yourself in such a political environment, be aware of a couple of things. First of all, whatever you think about these politicians, they have one thing in common. They are very good with language. And their rhetoric skills are pretty amazing. And it's not, it's not very fun to argue with them. Especially, especially when number one just gave you a hell of five minutes, kind of how ridiculous, um, and you want to respond the president of the House of Parliament is telling you, oh, you're, you're, I have you on the list, but you are number 18. So you have to wait for the other 17 guys who are beating the shit out of you before you can say the first word. 
And, um, well, and then the president stopped it and he asked for a vote and I won it. Hey, how surprising was that? But then I never got the commission. <laughs> So I had then a chance to do it in London, and here you see Prince Philip standing on the thing. I'm not playing the German national anthem. Uh, <laughs> he, he, suffers, uh, he suffers with the electronic sounds. He, he didn't like it very much either. Uh, another surprising call I've got was uh, from Elsa Prohaska, an architect from Vienna. She asked me to contribute an artwork uh, into the Figaro House in Vienna. It's the Mozart Museum. Uh, it's the original apartment where Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart used to live uh, for many years. And uh, she, she, she did the renovation. She made these ghost furnitures, very beautiful. And I had not quite an idea what I could as an artist contribute to this beautiful environment. On the other hand, I mean, uh, you, I mean, that's kind of, I was a little bit honored. I mean, that you don't say no right away. So I really started thinking about what could I do meaningful there uh, and uh, came up with the idea of, <clears throat> of taking one of his uh, handwritten musical scores, a sheet, sheet of music. Uh, it's the, op uh, the, the Opus 154 for piano, a little piece he has written for a piano student of him. And uh, I placed it behind a touch-sensitive sheet of glass, and uh, we developed a system that the moment you touch the note on the original document, you can hear the note played uh, by an electroacoustic electro audio system. When you wipe your finger along the score, you can sequence the melody according to the speed you're wiping your finger along. Of course, um, that, that raises a question immediately. Um, and uh, is it the right thing if some people are playing this music uh, in the wrong speed, backwards, forwards, right? Who, who is going to decide that? I knew that this will come, this question. I was prepared for it. And I, we, we were setting up a meeting with the uh, and invited uh, a lot of important people in this classical music business in Vienna, and in particular the president of the Wiener Musikverein, who is kind of the man of the heritage of Austrian classical music. And, uh, and it was a controversial discussion. Nobody actually know if that's right or wrong. And then this, this old man, 95 years old from the Wiener Musikverein, very tall, skinny, old man, very beautiful man, he didn't say anything. And then, then he said something, and he said, well, uh, uh, if uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart would have the opportunity to look down from heaven into his former apartment, and he would see a bunch of Japanese tourists playing this little piece of music, backwards, forwards, but for sure always in the wrong speed. How much would he like to see this image? And I believe he would like to see it a lot. He would like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that gave us then the excuse to continue with the project. But uh, it told me that for a Brahms museum, we would not have done that. <laughs> this is the first work I did after my arrival in, in Los Angeles from Frankfurt am Main. And uh, you can imagine that uh, this, is, this is not entirely a seamless transition. And uh, as you know, when you are in a different culture, different country, in the very early days, you, are, you have your eyes and ears wide open and you see a lot of things. You see a lot of differences. Very soon you get used to it and then you don't see them anymore. But these first very days, they're, they're all kind of interesting and electrifying. And there was one thing what irritated the hell out of me in the beginning when I was here, and that was the omnipresence of all these friendly people, all these happy people. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to make a piece of work with this, and I casted a number of uh, actresses, all with an 
with a uh, news anchor background and made them smile into a video camera for as long as they potentially could before they collapse. And, uh, and uh, while they were doing this, they were scrutinized by an amazingly sophisticated computer system developed by California, uh, by Caltech, California Institute of Technology and uh, the UC San Diego, an emotion recognition system. Back then, they didn't really know why they were researching this. Today, with all this surveillance, surveillance uh, kind of technology need from uh, probably from more than anything from Homeland Security, they probably found uh, uses for it. Uh, back then, it was kind of a little open, but it was an amazing system. And so the computer system is scrutinizing the sincerity of the smile of this woman while she's, while she's smiling into the camera. And whenever her, her, the, the sincerity of her smile goes under threshold, she's listening to a little alert signal what tells her to express more happiness. <laughs> so here you see the setup in our recording studio. The, the red green bar tells you how happy the computer is with a smile. So this is the very first minute of the recording, right? And then, so now you see uh, this woman here. Okay, beautiful. The, this woman after, just before she couldn't do it anymore. It was one, half, one and a half hour later. Well, I tell you, I'm not making fun out of American actresses, for sure not. Don't get me wrong. Nobody here in this room is able to make that thing silent for longer than 10 seconds. These people can do this. But she's completely exhausted. Look, the computer doesn't buy her anymore. One and a half hours smiling. But look how she, she, she's going to try one more time before she gives up. Look at this. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And this is how we had it on display. These, these actors, it's not a face gymnastic kind of exercise, because if you do this and you fail, the only way how you can do this is when you put yourself in a happy state, when you really feel seriously happy. That's the only way to keep that damn machine silent. And it's interesting that one, one woman, she just had a newborn baby, and for her it was a piece of cake. She just thought about her baby and there was no problem. Others had bigger problems. Um, and then I found years later this beautiful picture in a, in a newspaper, just before the Beijing Olympics, a smiling class for the hostesses uh, to understand what a friendly smile is when they are dealing with the tourists from overseas. I had success with uh, a series of work I call Tangible Cartoons. <clears throat> These are robotic sculptures. And um, the first one I did um, was in Tokyo again, uh, in front of these three towers. You see... I got a very, very sophisticated robotic camera with an automatic uh, how you call, a viewfinder system. It locks on a target. It comes from the military industry, and I designed it with this helmet and these eyes to give it a kind of a, a evil look. Uh, and that's standing there in the bushes and uh, scrutinizing the passers-by while they go along, and it locks in on, onto them. And then they are kind of then they are displayed on these three towers uh, behind 
behind the sculpture. When there's no body, the, the, the thing goes for motion as the first trigger. And if the, 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 the shrub, the, 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 the trees are swaying in the wind, then it locks on the trees and makes very beautiful patterns on, this, on these displays. The display uh, is custom made. I wanted to do it, it my own way. You see the, these pixels there, they are, they are three little pixels, right? They are usually red, green, and blue, and I just had them changed into white, white, white. And, um, and then have a frosted glass in front of it, and I play this, uh, this display only in bitmap graphics. Uh, here you see it again when it shows the, 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 the bushes. Uh, around, and it's only bitmap graphics, and it makes a, um, a, a very sort of poetic sort of image quality on this, on this uh, display system. The low resolution is strongly compensated by uh, the frosted glass in front of it. And then uh, these three towers uh, are part of an overall image, and as long as the the image is in motion, the brain fills the missing parts sort of into the image and it allows you to have a bigger experience while seeing these, these three displays. Kind of turned out um, to be a, a decent piece. But I found that robot a little too tiny and uh, I wanted to do something with a bigger one and uh, we got this one out of a car factory from General Motors. Um, it's a German product from a company called KUKA. And here's it in the, in the spray paint booth, just uh, shortly before we put it out. It, uh, it ended up in San Pedro, uh, Los Angeles Harbor. And uh, when, you are, when you are commissioned to make a work at, in a harbor, the first thing what comes to your mind most likely is to do something with a lighthouse, uh, with a beacon. The second thing what comes to your mind is to do something what has to do with machines. When you walk around there, you're gonna, you, you are impressed by these gigantic lifting machines. There's no way around that. Um, I learned what I find interesting. I, 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 I learned, I've forgotten how, much, how many containers they're moving in Los Angeles, a lot. It's not the biggest harbor, but it's a big harbor. But what I remember is, I mean, if I ask you the question how many uh, what, now what's the, what's the biggest importer of Chinese goods in the world? And you would hear the answer, it's the United, United States of America, you're not going to be surprised. Uh, second is Japan, number three, Germany, number four is Walmart, and number five is the United Kingdom. So <laughs> Walmart imports more goods than the United Kingdom. I found that remarkable. So these, these robots, they're usually working in car factories, like I said, the other thing I found kind of obvious to do is that the governor of this state I'm living in became a governor just because he had in his past a very strong meeting with a machine. Uh, there was a good reason to, to, to use such a robot for an installation in Los Angeles, at least to me. If you watch them performing in a car factory, uh, they are so anthropomorphic in their most motion performance that you never get tired of them. They don't look like machines, they look like creatures. That makes them so appealing to us. So I wanted to put him on a tall pedestal at the street corner. Here he is, holding a huge theater, outdoor theater light in his hand, shining a perfect circle on the floor. Uh, here you go and throwing it on a pedestrian when he comes by. <laughs> it works also in the daytime pretty good, just that the light is, is unnecessary, but you, you can see that it, that it is uh, reacting to people. You see the two surveillance cameras there, which are giving it the coordinates where people are found. It has a mesmerizing quality to it.
also a lonely guy on the pedestal makes the corner a little more alive. And then on the opposite side of the street, there's a, I mean, this part of San Pedro is still, have you, if, if, if you guys have not been to San Pedro, you have to go because this is a, one of the really, really great places here in Los Angeles. But it's still a little raunchy. Uh, and, uh, and then on the opposite side of this new building, there's something what you call, I think here, a hotel from hell where underprivileged people are ending up living. Uh, and uh, this gentleman, uh, he makes paintings of my sculpture and sells them in the street. Makes me very happy. <laughs> then I had an opportunity to make another one in Singapore at the new Terminal T T3. When you do some, I mean, Singapore for most of us is more known as a seaport than anything, right? And uh, so if you do something on an airport, I found actually seaport, airport have this propeller in common in a way that might be a good idea. When you look into propellers on the internet, you find amazing propellers. There's one from the 50s from an American aircraft carrier. It's a beautiful one from a Russian cargo airplane. And this is the one we use. It's, the, it's, a, it's a propeller from a contemporary cargo ship. And we made it out of fiberglass, and we put it onto the tip of this robot, again standing on a pedestal, and it stands there two stories tall from the arrival area, uh, looking, peeking into the departure area, like this. Right. Well, then that's what it does. It's uh, kind of playing with itself. It looks very nice against the the daylight with its translucent material. Performing its own kind of choreography at its wish. And it turns itself towards people. Whenever it recognizes people, it, it, it goes towards them. And if it's more people, then it goes towards the majority. And then, to my surprise, it happened that uh, uh, now uh, people on the day of their marriage go out there and have themselves photographed in front of that thing. And uh, I, maybe it became the lucky charm, uh, luck, some sort of a lucky charm. And I was really blown away when somebody was sending me this picture. Uh, and I, I was very happy about that. Here another airport project uh, uh, where it is in Seattle, SeaTac Airport, um, where I had pretty much everything in place for my project. And then this amazing water landing happened in the Hudson River. And I show you this sequence for those who have not seen it. It's, it's amazing. Check this 1549, 700, climbing 5,000. Check this 15.9 departure to contact, climb maintain 1 5,000. Maintain 1 5,000, check this 15.49. Check this 15.9, turn left lane 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 15.39, hit birds through across the rest of the returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Tire stop your departure, he's got emergency returning. Oh, it's fifteen twenty nine. He, he uh bird strike, he lost all engine he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning immediately. Cactus fifteen twenty nine which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus fifteen twenty nine. We can get it for you. Do you want to try to land one three one three? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. All right, Cactus fifteen forty nine. It's gonna be left traffic to runway three one. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire. Actually, LaGuardia departs guy, emergency inbound. Hey, go ahead. Cactus 1529 over the George Washington Bridge wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to our airport. Check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for, uh, runway one? Runway one. That's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280. You can land bird runway strike. one at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay. Which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the 
I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Cactus, 15.9, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Well, so it happened to me that, I, I mean, I was driving on Mulholland Drive in the middle of the day when I heard in the radio this, this thing, this, this communication. And I had to, I'm not kidding, I had to stop my car. I was so blown away by how a person can be so focused like this pilot in this moment of truth. I don't know. My hair was going up like this and, and my eyes was, were watering a little bit and I knew that I'm going to throw my entire project in the garbage can and I do something about flying humans and flying birds don't mix very well. Restless, I called it, highlights the unwelcoming nature of an airport environment towards our native bird population. And a little bit for me, it's also an honor to this amazing pilot who became another hero for me when he was uh, reporting to the, to the Congress how horribly treated these pilots and co-pilots are by their companies these days. I found it a very brave thing that he was standing up for his colleagues after he got that popularity. Um, the point is that the animal what caused this almost disaster is this graceful bird, right? It has nothing to do with those guys. Here a picture from <laughs> San Marco where we understand the concept of bird control and pest control and things like that, right? Um, so it is, a, it is a tragic situation. And, um, and uh, so I wanted to do something using off-the-shelf bird control gear and to make a sculpture out of it. This here are bird spikes. Some birds have long, tall legs, and it's not such a big deal. Uh, and then these, these propellers I always found fascinating on top of our billboards. You find them often here in Los Angeles to scare the pigeons away. And, uh, and um, this is... International Boulevard uh, is a freeway close to the airport, and it's a pedestrian bridge connecting to the terminal. That's a sketch I made, and that's the final thing. You see how the edges of this red board are kind of glowing a little bit, interesting enough. That comes from these bird spikes. They're breaking the light, actually, in a very, very beautiful way, and real, actually, even more beautiful than on the picture. And there you see these, they call them repellers, turning gracefully uh, as you walk along that pedestrian bridge, kind of in an endlessly changing choreography as their speeds are slightly off. It's a very simple installation, but has a very, creates a very, very calm and beautiful ambience. So I'll show you another work. What is a work in progress? Actually, it's not quite ready yet. Uh, it's also in Seattle. It's um, part of a water treatment facility, and here in particular, a pump station. In the older days, a water tower was the thing that put the pressure on the water, right? Uh, in, in newer days, that's all mechanical gear. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to do something about drinking water. Um, because it kind of irritates me when I go to a supermarket and I see these, uh, the, all these companies competing and trying to sell us the same product, water, when you think about it, what gives them the right to sell it to us in the first place? Yeah, so, so I found that strange. They bottle it in France and they ship it all over the Atlantic Ocean, while probably a ship from Alaska with some, some American water is on the way to Europe, and then they, middle, they meet in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and they can wave at each other, so we're shipping the water. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I learned that the Germans actually started it, the brand Apollinaris shipped in the, in the, in the uh, mid-19th uh, century 
1840 something, already half a million of these water bottles all around the world. It's impressive. I mean, what I find also impressive is that the corporate, I mean, the logo, the, the time, everything is still the same today. The bottle has changed. So I, want, I wanted to make a, a tower out of water bottles. I went for San Pellegrino because that looked kind of more like a normal water bottle to me. And I stuck them up, 5,000 of those, to a tower of uh, 60 feet in height, like this. And here you see the thing in my fabricator's shop, almost ready to go. There was a picture from last week. Quite happy with it. It will be, will be a nice, beautiful sculpture. The lighting was surprisingly difficult, so be careful. I mean, architects do this kind of stuff as well. Uh, be careful to, to, to shine light or to uh, anticipate that you can do great lighting on something what is transparent and reflective. It's a painful thing because what happens is that it looks great from one it has a sweet spot where it looks great. You step 10 yards back or forth and it's a completely different thing and very disappointing. So what we did, we made this mock-up, this uh, 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 a quarter size mock-up and we put it on a gigantic genie lift and we <laughs> moved it 60 feet up and down while we had our light system in the parking lot and we kind of simulated the, 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 the height of the thing, moving it up and down to see if there is no sweet spot. That was an annoying, time-consuming piece of work, and we couldn't figure it out. It was, it was unsuccessful to the end. And then, interesting, the girlfriend <laughs> of uh, my lighting designer, who is Nathan Thompson, a really famous lighting man from Australia, the girlfriend, right? She got this idea, why don't you paint the stick inside? You see, this is here on these sticks, right? Why, well, look at me, here, the stick inside. Why don't you paint the stick inside white? So we thought, well, that's an idea. So we, we cut white hoses, put them over the stick, brought it up, and it was set on fire right away. Amazing, the girlfriend. <laughs> so then, then, then I thought, I mean, everybody would think that, right? 5,000 bottles of water, so I, I called um, Nestle, they, they own San Pellegrino, and I asked them if it would be okay for them to ship me 5,000 bottles of water. I pay whatever it costs, even double the price, if, it, if they are empty and if they can without a label. I, I, I didn't find that a difficult request. Uh, and, if, and the answer was not really straightforward, yes. At the meantime, uh, the curator asked me uh, to, to, to write an artist statement, what they wanted to publish, and I did that. And uh, it reads as follows. The sculpture Verdi, that's the name, should be read as a reminder of the fact that some valuable mineral waters are of such quality that they are worth being shipped around the world for the drinking pleasures of those who can afford such thirst. But it, the general understanding should be that someone who wants to sell you water for money is a questionable friend <laughs> and likely not contributing much to the culture of humanity. <laughs> and that made us drink 5,000 bottle bottles of water and to scratch the labels off. <laughs> there was that you call bad timing. A lovely lady uh, in, invite, invited me, Muller, please participate in this in this call for, uh, for artists in this competition, and I and I did that, um, and then uh, I won it. That was great, and then she quit the job, <laughs> and so that was then not so great because then I was sitting there in a very conservative town uh, with a very small budget, and uh, so what that what I came up with a, a, li a, a public artwork in a library. Um, and I found books actually as, I mean, book is an artwork, if it's a great book, of course it's an artwork, but it's sculptural qualities um, 
uh, so so unless you you stack them on top of each other and uh, and then we also we all know that the storage system is also the display system for books right uh, the amazing libraries taking advantage out of the beauty of these uh, stored books. I mean, this is one of the greatest libraries I know, at least from the modern ones, from Gunnar Asplo in, Asplund in Stockholm. Um, I look at this. Fries, a burger, and okay, we have to do that again. This turning, um, the turning down the volume and bringing it up is not always successful. So now the volume is up, and we do that again. Hello, I'd like to order French fries, a burger, and a milkshake. This is a library. I'd like to order fries, a burger, and a milkshake. Well, well, it's somewhat funny, right? It's not too funny. But the, what, the, what the makers of this clip are touching here is actually something I find, and probably they did it accidentally, is something that is important and interesting to think about. The, the, the library as a public living room, right? Very, very successfully uh, realized by Rem Kolas in Seattle. Uh, the library becomes a public living room. It was it actually, if we, if we if, if, if just remember the, the, the dark days, uh, Nazi Germany, all the immigrants in the European countries around in the beginning, they were living in museums and libraries. These were safe havens. They, were, they could meet where they, didn't, they were not running into police, uh, immigration police. Uh, today, if you go, I don't know if you did, if you go to this library in Seattle, and that's why I find it actually so spectacular, the, it's, a, it's a place where you find a lot of underprivileged people being there in the wintertime more than in the summertime and how careful they are with the things. And so it makes me, it's a heartwarming, beautiful thing. I like, I, liked, I, liked, I like that a lot. Because the library is not functioning anymore in the traditional way. That's the birthday present I've got from my wife this year. It's an iPad, uh, kind of a selfish present as a, uh, I wake up at night and I read at night and she hates it when I switch on the light for reading and so she gave me that thing because that doesn't need any light and I can read it without bothering her. That's a good idea and of course I do this but I hate this thing at the same time and so I buy then the political ma magazine in a digital and in, an, in the conventional copy. Uh, <laughs> it doubles the price but that's the way I do it because in the daytime I would never read on that thing. Analog and digital. For storage, almost more than for display, uh, the storage of, of, of our writing, I mean, our writing is not going to, to, to be printed anymore. You know, it will end up on some, some internet service. I mean, they will never leave the format of the digital file. It will end up on some internet service, some of them open to the public, the others behind firewalls. That's just the logic of it, right? So what I came up with for this sculpture was the idea of making a big bookshelf in the entrance area made out of 5,000 of books in 12 different shades of gray. And uh, they are, well, let me, let me show you first how that looks. That looks like this when they are arranged in the, in the, in the, in the bookshelf in the right way. Um, Librarian asking for silence, but the, the community can purchase uh, these books, can use them as their personal notebooks, and they can uh, bring them back to the library. They get that get then by a li librarian replaced with one empty book from the sculpture, and so they have an endless supply of notebooks. Then and they are filling up the sculpture with the memories and thoughts and notes of the uh, people from the community. We all under the a possible thing to do. That's a, that's a kind of an interesting... We didn't do this. Somebody made this little video. Kind of nice. It took one day to put all these books in. The 
bookshelf itself is, uh, is, a, is a structural engineering wonder. Uh, this two-story super skinny sort of bookshelf, two-story high bookshelf, uh, with all these earthquake requirements was really, really difficult. And I wanted to have it as skinny as possible. And uh, it's almost made out of solid steel. That's a that's a work. I'm uh, I'm working with Rob Blay, who's sitting here uh, uh, together. Uh, we rented a studio together most recently in Silver Lake, um, and that's a project for the airport in Sacramento, and it deals with uh, uh, baggage handlers, as you can see. Um, it's, it's interesting when you look on the internet on YouTube, there are all these tipsy tourists in airplanes waiting for takeoff and making yes. fil filming with their video cameras the baggage handlers, how they're throwing their baggage, baggage, baggage around. Funny. So we're in Macau with baggage on the hill. Ja, daar gaat er een, daar gaat er nog een. Gooien. En dan komt, ja, doen. So we want to celebrate the baggage handlers. I have a, I, I have to show you, I found this comedian. I, I, I know this, but uh, let me do this. Uh, it's late enough to, to see something funny. I found it very funny. I bought myself a suitcase, a nice new, a posh suitcase with wheels. I'd always had a backpack. This was a first time for me. And then, then I flew to Australia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is what arrived. <laughs> Exactly, I knew you'd laugh. You see, this is, this is not funny. <laughs> oh, you're hilarious. Oh, look, look where some hilarious Australian baggage handlers put a sticker on there. Bend your knees. Heavy. <laughs> Very funny, my throat. 22 kilos of stuff I lost, apparently, according to that sticker. Listen, it's not for... This, oh, listen, I'll admit, I'll admit, if I'm completely honest, the first three times this went round the baggage carousel, I laughed as well. <laughs> the first three times I laughed, right? Everybody was laughing. The whole airport, was, fair enough. Everybody were, and, the, and then everybody asked. They went home. <laughs> it was just me and this. I thought I'd know what to do. I, I thought I'll sort this out. I'll sort this out. I'll take this over to the desk, I thought. But I didn't hear, there's an Austra typical Australian girl on the desk. She says, what seems to be the problem? I said, mainly it's about my luggage. She said, is that not it? I said, this is some of it. Hey, don't get me wrong, I'm thrilled to get this back. The thing is, I'm here for two months. I'm pretty sure I packed more than this. <laughs> this is what you like, you find this kind of thing for... And then she starts asking me those questions. You get these questions everywhere. I know. There was no need for it. No need. She said, could anybody have interfered with it? I said, we probably shouldn't rule that out. She said, well, have you left it unattended at any point? I said, I suppose I must have. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And so on. It goes on. It's uh, very beautiful. I didn't know this gentleman. I found him extremely funny. So celebrating the baggage handlers is what we're going to do. The longshore man of the airport. Uh, uh, the artwork should recognize the baggage handler as part of a largely invisible manual labor force at work within the machine-like reality of air cargo and travel. These are two gigantic panels in the, in the lobby, in the departure lobby. Uh, they are, I think each is 75 feet long, and, uh, and uh, we're going to have portraits made in bitmap graphics uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system where sh light projected on, on our panels is casting shadow, and these shadows are actually making the information to, to see these 
these bitmap graphics to see these things will be uh, something like this. This is how the appearance will be made out of plywood. And, um, and uh, what was kind of a little bit depressing when uh, Rob and I started in this, in this uh, new shop, kind of a decent sized shop, and now we are sitting here with walls of plywood and, uh, and we have to CNC mill out us out of that problem. <laughs> yeah. The last project I'm going to show you is a work I did in San, San Jose. Uh, it's, a, it's a curtain wall for a building uh, made out of two layers of chain link fence and two different sizes, enhanced with 500,000 of these uh, plastic chips and then mounted on the facade, looks something like that. Right? Kind of beautiful, the, 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 the translucence of it and uh, makes these hands almost like hands of ghosts at night, kind of uh, sitting in front of the building. We developed kind of a sophisticated machine for, for this to, to find the positioning of, uh, of uh, these plastic chips on the chain link fence. It was also a lot of material to move around. We rented an air airport hunger for this. Um, had a lot of helpers. And uh, this machine, here you see a short video. Looks almost like a, like a plotter, like a, like a printer. Uh, it has a, has a board of, a, of a, an, has an LED matrix on it, when you position it in the in the right place, then the LEDs LEDs are highlighting uh, the locations where these plastic chips wants to be clipped in. Right? Uh, that was all programmed by uh, Jay, who's sitting here probably somewhere. And uh, it's a, in a way, it's not so difficult this kind of work. The only trouble is it doesn't allow any mistakes, and to do such a rapid thing 500,000 times by not allowing any mistake that is the problem so it's more in the logistics in the labeling and all of that so that's how we had them wrapped up in rolls and that was then waiting to be picked up uh, by the contractor to be mounted on the wall and that's how it looks like it's relatively large is 1,300 feet long and 60 feet tall and then so I'm coming to the end I mean, in a, I'm doing this, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, when, when, when you do works, uh, some, of them, some of them are great and uh, some are okay. Uh, some of them become very successful. Sometimes you don't even know why. It's a little bit out of control. You got lucky. Uh, so they, they have all, all sorts of meanings for you. Some have a, have a greater meaning. Some have great memories, how it was put together with a great crew of friends and or created a lot of friends. But it doesn't happen very often that you are proud of something. So where you say, well, oh, Jesus, that was, you are such a great guy. You know, that actually doesn't, doesn't happen almost never, at least not to me. Uh, it happened once, and, um, and that was, uh, that the first slide I showed you, this, this expensive facade installation in, in Frankfurt in, the, in uh, 1990, um, there was a super rich developer, and uh, and he asked me at one point, hey, "Can we can we do something uh, kind of eventish on that facade?" And I said, "Well, yeah, maybe, but it should have kind of it has to have some kind of cult cultural. There's there's a bar we want to reach, right?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that." And so we we bought the most expensive audio gear you can possibly think of. We installed it into the facade to to create um, a, a sound ambience in front of that building what is close to what you know from chamber music, yeah, not rock and roll. And, uh, and then we rented uh, office space on the opposite side of the street, and we brought in the two biggest video projectors back then available. They had a, each of them had a water hose for cooling purposes of this diameter. And, um, and we made the biggest video projection uh, back then 
technically possible and had the sound playing and I invited Oscar Zala, uh, uh, at that time a 92 years old man who is the inventor of the first synthesizer, he called it Trautonium. And uh, he made, for example, he opened the Olympic Games in Berlin in 1936 with synthesizer music. He then later made a lot of music for, uh, for movies. So if you see next time Hitchcock the birds again, there's not a single bird making any sound. Can you bring up the volume a little bit? It's all created with, a, with his tritonium. Uh, way before Moog introduced his first synthesizer. It's amazing, if you close your eyes, you actually can see that's electronic sounds, but it's fantastic. And he's, he's a fantastic musician by himself. And so I, I could convince him to come from Berlin uh, to, to give a concert. He wanted to not to do it in front of a big crowd, he wanted to have a small studio. We gave him a small studio, we had probably only a hundred people sitting in there as, uh, as visitors, but then thousands of people outside. Everybody came, Tangerine Dream, Kraftwerk, everybody came. He's the, the man of electronic music and I, we had him performing there. Live video broadcasted in gigantic scale with this fantastic audio system. He, why he doesn't like to play in public and that reason is that it takes him from one piece of music to the next piece of music up to 20 minutes to adjust all his buttons because it's a completely analog instrument there are no presets and nothing and uh, I told him there's no problem we're gonna show sequences out of your out of your great movies while you're adjusting your buttons and there will be no problem and um, and that's what we did Here you see a sequence out of the movie Eine Reise zum Mond, A Voyage to the Moon. It shows material what was never re released, never shown in America, uh, of all what went wrong on the moon, on the, during the moon landings. And uh, Zala had great friends in the, in, at NASA for historical reasons, and they gave him the, all this material, and he said, do something nice with it. And he compiled this beautiful movie together with Manfred Dornjok and made all the sounds for it. And here in this sequence, the astronauts are trying to stick something in the ground, maybe to get a sample uh, from the moon. And uh, with a lack of gravity, that becomes a major problem, as we see. It's very beautiful footage. I don't know what's embarrassing about it. I find it super, super nice. <laughs>
Well, that was it. Thank you very much.